Great turnout. Shall we start? Okay. Who's in charge? Rita, who's going to kick us off? Okay, so I'm going to start. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next, the April edition of the Catalyst Seminar. Um, thank you for joining. Um, as you can see, the topic today is poverty, inequality, and children's mental health. Um, we have two very exciting speakers, uh, Dr. Sophie Wickham and Dr. Michael Matusis, um, who will give us talks from very different disciplinary perspectives and in the sort of spirit of the Catalyst Seminars, where the idea is that we bring different disciplines together to talk about a certain topic, and then we have discussion that is sort of more general and thinking about interdisciplinary linkage. So the plan is that each of them will speak for around 15 to 20 minutes, one after the other, without a gap for questions in between. And then we have a question and answer session for the entire panel. Um, uh, uh, Professor John Reusser will be the discussant and after their talks will provide some reflections and thoughts around opportunities um, and intersections between the two areas. And we'll also pass on to Professor Pascal Fioran who will give us a few um, sort of insights into um, research happening around, in UCL around early interventions, just to also cover the intervention perspective. Um, just before we um, start and I introduce the speakers, I was asked to sort of um, just do a little bit of scene setting uh, for the topic and why we thought it was a really important topic to tackle today. Um, so in terms of uh, the UK context, um, although uh, it's, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world, um, more than four and a half million children live in poverty in the UK. Um, it was slightly lower before the pandemic. The pandemic has only exacerbated things. And um, the reason I flagged that we're one of the richest countries in the world is also because I think in, in a country like this, it is also a political choice. So I don't think um, children living in poverty needs to be the case in a country with as much money as is present here. And another uh, sort of insight into it being political choice was sort of um, flagged very recently in the pandemic with a whole fiasco around free school meals um, in the last year for anybody who was following the news, I'm sure you saw this. So I think it's important to remember, at least in the UK context, that child poverty is a tractable problem that we could actually be doing things about. The other two things I wanted to just flag are things thinking about how thinking about poverty and mental health might be different in children in the context of children's mental health compared to adults. And obviously one clear distinction is in, when we talk about children's mental health, um, their socioeconomic circumstances are determined by their carer's socioeconomic circumstances compared to themselves. So in adults that is different, you think about the adult's own income and their mental health. So that's one thing that is specific to children. Um, and the other thing that I think is important in the children's context is who reports on the child's mental health. So unlike in adults where mostly adults report on their mental health, um, in children it's very common to have proxy reporters of mental health, usually the parents, but also teachers and other proxy reporters. And I think, um, again, there's some work done around socioeconomic gradients in mental health of children, but that varies by reporter. The only other thing I wanted to flag is often people can conceptualize socioeconomic circumstances using certain measures. So for example, parental education or occupational class or income, but to flag that there are many different indicators of socioeconomic circumstances like wealth, neighborhood deprivation, and also subjective indicators like comparative wealth and comparative income. And they're all important. And just to sort of show you a few graphs to make the case, this is work being done by Matthew Hazel at UCL, but um, that, all of these different indicators of um, socioeconomic circumstances explain unique variants in children's mental health. Here we have both parent, out, parent reported mental health outcomes and child reported mental health outcomes. And on the y-axis, you can see percentage of variance explained. And the other thing to just flag is the difference between parent and child reported uh, mental health here. So just to give you um, a sort of looking at the gradient from highest income to lowest income quintiles, the gradient, the health, the mental health gradient in parent reported child symptoms is much steeper than in child own reported um, mental health symptoms. So just again flagging one aspect of 
something to consider when we do child mental health research. And then the last thing I just wanted to flag, and this is recent data from the Millennium Cohort Study, which I know Sophie will also be talking about data from this cohort, is that the gradients of the socioeconomic um, differences also vary based on the mental health outcome we look at. So here we can see high distress, there's a classic gradient with a little bit of a increase at the second uh, quintile, which is what we see in national data as well. But then for self-harm, you see there's almost no gradient in mental uh, self-harm outcomes by income. And then suicide attempts have a very different gradient where it, the, the most deprived uh, or disadvantaged groups have double the uh, prevalence of attempted suicide by age 17 compared to the most advantaged. So it's not a like sort of monotonic gradient, it's sort of a step. So the most disadvantaged have twice the rate as the least disadvantaged. And on that, I will hand over to um, Sophie. Um, so while Sophie sets up her slides, just to make an introduction, uh, Dr. Sophie Wickham is a Wellcome Trust Research Fellow in the Department of Public Health, Policy and Systems at the University of Liverpool. She is part of a team that researches the effects of welfare reform and poverty on different aspects of health, and health inequalities and has done extensive research on health inequalities in the UK and on the health consequences on, of poverty. Sophie plans to talk today about her work on the psychological impact of poverty and will discuss the wider policy context in which this work sits. Sophie, hand over to you. Typical thing, I didn't unmute myself, apologies. <laughs> Um, okay, so thank you very much, Pravita. So um, I'm going to talk about the psychological impact of poverty and the importance of policy. So I'll talk a little bit about child mental health and mental health inequalities, and I'll lead into two studies that I've done that have looked into um, looked at income child poverty and its impact on child and maternal mental health, and looking at this um, from a context and importance of policy. Uh, specifically around social security um, from a public health perspective. So some of the work that I'm going to describe has actually been submitted um, as written evidence to the Department of Works and Pensions Select Committee as they had an inquiry into how we measure poverty, um, which was led by a colleague of mine here at Liverpool, uh, Kate Mason, um, and to which actually a senior colleague, David Taylor Robinson gave oral evidence this morning. So if anyone wants to catch up on this, I think you can look at it on Parliament TV. So uh, let's start with child mental health. So we are in a mental health crisis in the UK and this was the case even before the pandemic. So from NHS digital um, data, we can see that compared to 2017 where there was one in nine children experiencing probable mental disorders. We are now seeing one in six children with probable mental disorders. That's a sharp rise in just a few years. And we are also seeing huge inequalities in mental health. So this image here on the left shows the large mental health inequalities that we are seeing across England. This is a composite annual measure of population mental health. So it's, this isn't just children for each lower super output area in England and it combines data on multiple um, mental health sources such as um, NHS, relate, um, NHS mental health related hospital attendances, prescription data, specifically antidepressants and any incapacity benefit and employment support allowances for mental illness into one single index. In Liverpool where I live and work, um, before the pandemic there were around 20,000 more people with mental health difficulties compared to the rest of the country and you can see in this image um, the harsh red colours um, experienced in Liverpool that has been zoomed in on where better, you know, better mental health outcomes are the bluer areas. But it's not just mental health that you see these large inequalities, it's all health. So in Liverpool, again, we have 1,300 excess deaths in that same year, 2019, 13,000 more working age people living with a disability. And if you think about your own life expectancy at birth, the, this is a different depending on the postcode in which you were born. So a child born in Kensington in Liverpool can expect to live 10 fewer years than a child born in Kensington in London. This gap rises to 20 years if we think about life lived in good health. The point about these mental health inequalities is that they are unjust, they are unfair and avoidable um, with the right mix of government policies. 
So the drivers of many mental health inequalities are structural. They're due to inequalities in the main influences on health, as outlined by this um, Dal Green and Whitehead rainbow, which identify the social determinants of health. To, but to be clear, the drivers of many of these inequalities, they're about differences in poverty, differences in power and resources that are needed for good health. They're about differences in exposure to health damaging environments environments and differences in opportunities to enjoy positive health factors and protective conditions that help maintain health and all of these things you can see how poverty is integrated into all of them and these are all driven by policy the problem that we're seeing at the moment and the problem that we were seeing pre-pandemic is about child poverty and how it has been rising so before the pandemic there were a total of around 14.5 million people living in poverty and at least 4.2 of those were children. That's 30% of all children. In Liverpool, again, there were 31,000 children living in poverty. In Liverpool, it increased by 1,000 from the previous year and 6,000 more than five years before that. Child poverty has increased um, since 2010, reversing longer term trends of falling poverty. And in fact, all four official measures of child poverty show large increases in the number of children living in households below 60% of the median income, both before and after housing costs, particularly in the most recent years following reforms to the welfare system. And I think it's important to remember that work has not provided a guaranteed route out of child poverty. So with more than 70% of children living in households where somebody is working. So this flow diagram really represents a simplified example of how um, household poverty influences child life chances, so their child mental health and development leading to negative impacts across the life course. There's a substantial body of scientific evidence that links child poverty to poorer educational, uh, physical and psychosocial outcomes during childhood and across um, later stages of life. Early life exposures to poverty and other significant adversities impact not only the developing brain, but also other organs and in fact the immune system. And collectively these developmental disruptions leave a child more susceptible to physical and psychosocial stressors as they get older, undermining their mental and physical health through adolescence and into adulthood. So the policy debate in the UK has really focused on the use of child poverty measure, measures um, for policy purposes and on whether they are meaningfully um, reflecting children's life chances. So back in 2016, uh, the UK government proposed replacing its statutory child uh, poverty targets, which were based on income with indicators of child disadvantage that were not specifically related to income. Namely, if, they, if people were living in a workless household, if they had low educational attainment, family instability and addiction. And the government argued that strategies to improve children's life chances should focus on increasing uh, parental employment rather than welfare cash transfer, so the benefit system, which lift people out of income poverty without necessarily changing their employment status. So as a response, we just, uh, wanted to look at, this, at a sample of people that had never experienced poverty, income poverty, and never experienced um, mental health and looked at what happened to their mental health over time, independent of employment st status, when they moved into poverty. And this was published in 2017 now um, in the Lancet Public Health. We used the Millennium Cohort Study, which uh, Pravitha's uh, mentioned, which is a large na nationally representative cohort sample of children that were born in the UK between 2000 and 2002 and uh, have been followed up every few years. I think now there's seven waves of data. At the time of this study was published, there were five. So it was when the children were around nine months, three, five, seven and 11. And the study oversamples children living in disadvantaged areas and in those with high proportion of ethnic minority groups by means of stratified clustered sampling design. So it's really rich data that they have on lots of things around poverty, household setup, um, and health and mental health outcomes. So our total sample that entered into the analysis was around 6,000, and this was reduced from around 16,000 in that way. And that was primarily because we really wanted to capture what was going on for people that had previously good mental health and previously had not experienced poverty. And uh, I guess in 
simple terms, we were looking at this kind of model. So a transition into poverty and poverty was income poverty. It was based on self-reported income, 60% of medium household income. And it was equivalized according to the OECD household equivalized scale, which is derived by the Millennium Cohort Study. And then look at the impact that it has on both children's mental health and maternal's mental health. Now, keeping in mind what was said previously, it was parental reported uh, socio-emotional behavior problems done by the strengths and difficulties, difficulties question, questionnaire, sorry, with um, child mental health. And then psychological distress of mothers um, using the Kessler six scale. And then we had confounders, um, things like child and maternal ethnicity, uh, child sex, age of the mother at, um, the, at the time of the cohort birth, and then the household setup. So whether people were living in a single parent household or not. And we basically did a discrete time hazard survival model um, to follow up families that were free of mental health problems at baseline, so at age three of the child, and investigated whether or not a transition into poverty was associated with an onset of new mental health problems, conditional and being free of those mental health difficulties up to that time point. So the main results for this study, so this uh, figure shows the survival curves for our two outcomes, which are, it's very small, um, this green one's the psychological distress of mothers, and this one's children that have remained free of socio-emotional behavior problems, and then this red one here is the poverty line. So this is, you can see at the beginning when children are three, 100% of our sample were not in poverty and were free of psychological distress. And then as you go through, you can see the drop-offs of people as they enter poverty and enter psychological distress. And I think the main thing that I want um, you to hear from this study is that a single transition into poverty during childhood was associated with an increased risk of both child's and maternal mental health difficulties, whether you look at the adjusted or unadjusted ratio, odds ratios here. Uh, and this was independent of any changes to their employment status. Now, when we included mother's mental health into the child's model, um, we can see that it accounts for some of the association between um, living in, a, in income poverty and child mental health, suggesting that this is an important part of the pathway. So we have found that a single movement into poverty is damaging for mental health, but what about different patterns of exposure to income poverty? So this leads on to the second study. Um, which was published in 2019, which was looked at the poverty dynamics of health in late childhood in the UK. And what we really wanted to look at is, des is describing different patterns of poverty experienced by children. Um, and we looked at this with not just mental health outcomes, but other health outcomes. So again, we use the same measure of income poverty, which was relative income poverty, self-reported 60% below the medium household income. And we had three health outcomes, socio-emotional behavioral problems, obesity, and long-standing illness. Um, and what we wanted to do was create latent classes to understand the um, tra trajectories of poverty that children experienced. And this latent class analysis identified four trajectories of poverty. Um, so never, ex never in poverty, poverty in early childhood, poverty in late childhood, um, and what we called persistent poverty. So children that were identified in poverty in each wave of the Millennium Cohort Study. And then we used these trajectories to inform the multivariable logistic regression to assess the association between poverty and health outcomes. We also did a dose response analysis um, to observe the cumulative effect of um, exposure to child poverty. So you can see from this um, bar chart here that 60% of the um, study sample remained out of poverty, whilst 40% um, had experienced some level of poverty with 20% um, being reported in poverty at each wave of the Millennium Cohort Study and then differing for uh, experiences in early childhood and in late childhood. And what we found was that any exposure to poverty was associated with an increased with risk of all health outcomes. So socio-emotional behavioral difficulties had the biggest with persistent poverty more than three times as likely to experience mental health, socio-emotional behavioral difficulties than those that were never in poverty. Um, but any exposure was um, detrimental. 
and then looking at the dose response relationship between the increase um, in poverty and socio-emotional behavioral difficulties highlights that there is a quite a strong specifically for um, socio-emotional behavioral difficulties um, effect of poverty income poverty so what these two studies really add to and add to a large body of literature about the importance of an income based measure of poverty and its clear importance when we're thinking about its impact. As I mentioned before, the government had argued that strategies to improve children's life chances, so child mental health, should focus on an increase in parental employment rather than things like welfare cash transfers. Um, and I think our studies and other studies out there highlight that it's not just about parental employment, this income poverty is so important. Both studies add to the existing evidence that it's detrimental for mental health. And in fact, any exposure of poverty is bad. And as we're seeing large amounts of children due to the pandemic moving into poverty, it should be of a real concern to us all. So where should the focus be? Well, policymakers are often concerned that increasing access to benefits disincentivizes employment. And whilst improving employment prospects is an important component, we must recognize that we're about to enter a recession. Um, and it is important to any strategy that reduces child poverty, we have to remember that currently employment isn't paying enough. If you think back to the slide at the beginning where I talked about 70% of children are in households where somebody is working, we need to change what employment looks like if employment is going to be the focus. But really, we need to recognize that rises in child poverty, homelessness, food poverty, and a deterioration in mental health across the board have been observed and they've occurred at the same time as a reversal of investment in public services with biggest cuts going to um, the most deprived areas. So areas of the greatest need. Um, a systematic review done by Cooper and Stewart on the Im impact of money for children's health outcomes suggests that any strategy with specific targets to improve life chances for children, i.e. child mental health, without focusing on child poverty will struggle as there will be an increased demand on services as poverty levels rise. I think the cost of austerity measures, these fiscal policies that are designed to reduce government spending primarily through the welfare system, whilst have been fiscally successful at reducing spending, um, have had direct consequences for poverty and health, which have been heavily criticised. So it was mentioned before, poverty is a political choice. Uh, Philip Alston, who was the UN Rapporteur for Extreme Poverty, who came to the UK in 2018 to sort of assess how we're doing, suggests that the cost of austerity has fallen disproportionately upon the poor, women, racial and ethnic minorities, children, single parents, and people with disability. And it's because of all these changes that we've seen to the benefit system. So the new benefit universal credit, which encapsulates a lot of these other welfare changes has had an impact on adult mental health. And if you think back to that first study where we find that mother's mental health is important for child's mental health, we need to think about policies that think uh, that focus on the whole family, both adults and children. Analysis from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation show that the removal of that 20 pounds uplift that universal credit has had during the pandemic Demic, which is a threat to be removed, would mean 6.2 million low income families would lose over a thousand pounds of their annual income overnight, pushing around, I think it's 500,000 people into poverty, which includes something like 200,000 children. The mental health toll um, this is likely to have is going to be very harsh. And whilst improving prospects is so important, strategies to re reduce child poverty in strategies to reduce child poverty, it is widely recognized that there is a need. This is needs to happen alongside actions to main and expand adequate social security protection. So policy action is needed to address the upstream determinants of child mental health with a focus on not only parental income, but introducing you know, a living wage employment that meets the costs of living and high quality early childcare and a social security safety net that is both respectful and supportive for people during a time of adversity. I think the message is clear. We need to act early, we need to act on time and we need to act together to advocate for children and young people. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Sophie. Um, while both of you swap 
slides, I will introduce uh, Michael. So Dr. Michael Matusis is a lecturer in neuroscience at the Wellcome Center for Human Neuroimaging and an honorary cons consultant psychiatrist in psychotherapy in the National Hospital Next Door. He has worked on cognition and structural neuroimaging during adolescence and young adulthood, but has also seen his own children and students grow through this developmental period. Many were not unscathed, which adds a personal meaning to the work he will tell you about now. While, um, before Michael starts, I also just want to remind people to think about questions. Um, so just think about questions and once Michael has finished presenting, uh, you can either unmute and ask the question or type the question into the chat and we will sort of, um, I will pick and ask um, speakers and the panel the questions. Thank you, I'll hand over to you, Michael. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Pravika. I have to say, sort of, uh, this is uh, this was unplanned. What, what an act to follow, Sophie. I was, I was just so impressed. So um, I'm going to um, try and uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the brain and uh, myelination specifically, and uh, how it appears to progress more slowly in adolescents who uh, grow up in inequality. Um, so as an overview, I'm going to talk about these brain differences um, and then with respect to our key study, what do they mean? And I'm going to refer to the, um, there's some theories that are floating around, um, just world theory, scarcity theory, damage theory. And I'm going to try and focus on diversity theory and, and uh, uh, stress vulnerability um, uh, approaches. And I'm going to appeal for further large uh, international studies uh, of the brain that focus on neurodiversity rather than just um, health versus illness. Um, so my key study is uh, going to be um, about uh, this uh, myelin marker, um, uh, which we studied in uh, uh, 300 young people, um, starting from the age of uh, 14 and going to the age of uh, 24 in an um, uh, accelerated longitudinal um, study. And um, this marker, is uh, MT uh, looks uh, primarily at myelin, uh, but generally development of micromolecules uh, in the brain. Um, and these are uh, two uh, key colleagues that uh, we worked with, uh, particularly Gabriel Ziegler, and uh, who is the imager who did most of these analyses, and also B. Hauser, um, uh, we first did a, a, a sort of a, the, the, the neurotypical analysis, what happens uh, in myelin uh, in the brain uh, during those uh, critical years uh, of from 14 on um, to these children and young people. And what we find um, in brief um, is that there is quite active myelination that involves, um, first of all, the cortical gray matter. So um, for those not so familiar, here we have myelin within the gray matter, which normally we think of myelin mostly in white matter. Um, and we see that there's myelination in the, in the cingulate gyrus, cuneus, precuneus. Um, and then when we move to the cortical white, which is just uh, deep to the, to the gray, uh, we see uh, corresponding changes, um, uh, maybe a bit more prominent in the temporal lobe. Um, and then going deeper still at the, at the coral white uh, matter, uh, we see internal capsule um, myelination. Uh, now I'm going to compare this general pattern of what happens in, in the brain in the, in the neurotypical uh, situation with what happens in uh, young people who have experienced um, deprivation. And the, the, we, we used uh, different measures of deprivation, but the one that actually turned out to be most meaningful was the neighborhood level um, relative deprivation, uh, much like uh, what Sophie uh, talks about, which is uh, the proportion of households that live in conventionally um, uh, uh, conventionally defined uh, poverty uh, within a fairly small geographical area. So this is actually a, a measure of relative poverty, and so I think it reflects a lot uh, about inequality um, as well as you know the experience of living in inequality as well as the experience of living in poverty itself. Um, and what we find um, is that uh, there is corresponding areas of reducing myelination uh, in these um, uh, adolescents who have experienced deprivation before. So this isn't the current deprivation that they are experiencing, is what they have experienced um, before, and we control for the current deprivation. So this is quite strict. Um, 
And uh, as you can see, we find in the, in the medial uh, surface of the, of the hemisphere quite um, similar uh, motor and premotor areas, but also now in the, in the lateral hemisphere, um, motor and premotor areas. Um, and if we look uh, deeper into the brain, we see um, that there is a lot of uh, insular changes. So the myelin uh, develops more slowly in these young people in the insula. Um, and also the ventral striatum, bits of the hippocampi, and quite prominently in the param pyramidal tract, uh, which the pyramidal tract, of course, you might think this, is, this makes sense in terms of the motor and premotor findings, but quite striking widespread findings, and they're all in the same direction. Um, so um, we then looked uh, in, a, in, a, in a less strict way, slightly more preliminary way, uh, in another measure, uh, which is um, iron growth. And so iron growth is very important in, in, in children's brains. Uh, it also relates to myelin, the, the supportive cells that, um, that, that, uh, that grow myelin um, use a lot of iron. Uh, and the top row uh, here is, is again a different way of plotting the, the, our first marker, MT. And the second row is the, um, is the um, R2 star, which is the um, iron growth. And what we, you see here is that although there is a cortical gray iron growth, um, like we had before, uh, this is not as prominent and we have very strong um, striatal, um, striatal uh, um, iron growth. Um, and what we find is, again, that in these children who have uh, experienced um, socioeconomic uh, disadvantage, um, there is attenuation of the growth in areas not too dissimilar to uh, the areas where we find a very prominent growth in the, in the, in the neurotypical situation, particularly in the striatum. I have to say that you shouldn't take the, the, the specific points where um, these uh, areas are significant too, uh, too seriously. There, there is quite a bit of error in identifying the specific uh, areas, the specific extent of the areas. Um, so um, we uh, also in these kids and in a, in a related uh, cohort, uh, we did some computational psychiatry behavioral um, studies. And although we didn't have the power to, to correct the two directly, um, I think the computational studies are very important in order to understand a bit um, about um, what was going on, what is going on, how these young people may have changed their, their brain function, and also to highlight some sort of, of the, the intersectional um, aspects um, of uh, inequality. So although we talked a lot about inequality in terms of um, uh, income inequality, um, the, the, the inequality is, is multifactorial and the experienced sense of inequality is multifactorial. So um, I'm just going to talk briefly about this task, which is the investor trustee task, uh, where our participant, um, which is the, uh, the, the, the thing in blue here, uh, receives an endowment, uh, and then they choose to give some of that to a trustee. Um, the, uh, the, what they give triples. Um, so the, the trustee has a lot of uh, money in their hands, and they can cho choose to uh, return some back. And if this collaboration works well, both parties can make a lot, okay? Obviously, if you give over and you don't get anything back, you lose. Um, if you don't give anything over, no one makes anything extra. Um, and these are my colleagues who uh, uh, have uh, looked after this uh, task and these data. Um, and Andreas Hula, in particular, did the, 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 the mathematical modeling. Um, and what we found, uh, first of all, was that gender had a big role here. Um, the young women took insufficient risks to optimize their outcomes. And this was, this is, this was uh, uh, reflected in the models uh, in a particular parameter that we called um, social risk aversion. Um, so they were less likely to, to take social risks. Um, and in another task, we found again that the young women, the, you know, the, these are 14 year olds plus, so the you know, adolescent uh, uh, young women, um, uh, did not dare enough, um, didn't, again, didn't take enough risks of a different sort to maximize their incomes. So here, it, then we may have an inequality which is gender related, but what is it about? Looking specifically at economic disadvantage, 
and we found some complex, uh, a complex picture with, in some ways, the more economically disadvantaged kids um, played in a more sophisticated manner. But they also um, uh, uh, played a lot more defensively. So overall, they had, again, poorer returns. Um, so how could we sort of uh, put it all together? Well, we don't know. And I think that we do need much better studies to link all these bits together. Um, but um, things that have been put forward um, have been, first of all, a, a just world theory. Um, which says that what you see really is just what happens. The, the, the changes that you see are just a marker of merit. You know, how good someone's brain is and how well they're going to do in life and their family, and that's it. Um, there's no sort of uh, particular uh, uh, cause for worry in a sense. Scarcity theory would say that these brain changes are an adaptation to the environment, so that these deprived people actually have to do something and what you see that they how they respond is reflected in a brain whereas damage theory is the thing that most of us in, in health work would um would sort of come first in mind which is that the brain changes are maladaptive uh, analogous to for, for example changes uh, uh, that uh, smoking might cause in the lungs uh, i think that diversity theory has brought a new angle to all this saying that possibly these things actually um, don't go one way, um, and that some of the changes you see in association with, uh, with uh, poor social outcomes might be because you have unmet needs in people who have got different brains. And it's actually unjust to make people with different brains fit in with the choices and lifestyles that the, the majority makes. Um, in, in, in terms of just world theory, just to, just to tell you uh, 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 the kind of arguments that people make, um, which I certainly don't go along with, but this is made, um, this is a map of IQ um, uh, by country. Um, and the idea is that uh, poor people may actually choose to be poor by uh, choosing not to pay the price in effort that it takes to be rich. Um, and um, that uh, obviously if you are not quite as clever, uh, it's much more difficult to do things. It, it takes a lot of effort. So, um, so you know, you choose not to be rich. Um, you can see what the problems of this might be. Um, and I'm going to move on um, to scarcity theory, which says that uh, uh, changes are adaptive. And this is partly based on animal work um, that shows, for example, that if you stress very young animals, you have faster myelin growth um, originally, and which then levels out. So it could be that what we see here as reduced rate of growth of myelin is a leveling out after these kids have actually grown faster before. And there's some evidence for this in the literature, but we didn't find any evidence for baseline differences, unlike some of the big studies in the literature. And we didn't find any curvilinear components, uh, sort of uh, that 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 um, uh, uh, growth was plateauing after uh, faster earlier maturation. So the, the the main thing is that we were left with uh, was sort of the damage theory, and this is um, uh, the the idea is that these these uh, neurotypical changes are the thing that should happen, and the fact that you see less of it is a, is a bad thing. Um, and this is actually in line with um, a fair bit in the literature that says, for example, that in functional studies, Ho and Farah have uh, reviewed this recently, um, the more deprived um, young people show stronger, um, uh, stronger responses to negative stimuli and less strong responses to positive stimuli. And, and this might be a hint that they're more prone to depression and anxiety, thought of as a disorder, as a as a, as, a, as, a, as a psychiatric um, diagnosis. But I would put forward the, 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 the sort of the view that we, we have in psychiatry and other conditions, um, which um, is a sort of a, a, an advance on the stress vulnerability model that says that this isn't just straightforward damage, that you have some antecedents, which are, uh, include uh, people's genes and people's early development, and that brings up a diverse and modifiable state of the brain. And I stress both the diverse and the modifiable. And then you have the socioeconomic disadvantage, disadvantage that forms a context for this development, 
And you see the signs of the atypical development, such as the myelination differences that uh, I, uh, I showed you, or indeed the behavioral differences where the, the young women in some sense um, have been taught within quotes not to take those uh, uh, risks. So context is the key, and I think it should be people's, con the context of people's lives should be uh, uh, studied more. So in conclusion, uh, we saw the childhood relative dis socioeconomic disadvantage, not just relative, but I stress the relative, at the neighborhood level predicted slower brain growth. Um, both the macromolecular content and the non-heme iron were affected. Um, uh, myelin in the cingulate, pecunious, and motor areas, um, the, the non-heme iron more in the striatum, but also in the lateral parietal cortex, which I didn't uh, speak about, sorry about that. Um, and I think the overall model is, is, is best thought uh, about in this vertical pleiotropy or stress diathesis framework. And what I would say is that um, these things we, we've measured within the UK, but for, for those of us that care about these issues, it, you, it really strikes you that if for us to see these things in the UK, there must be massive effects happening internationally that we really should uh, study and the same kind of natural experiment that uh, Sophie talks about should be uh, done on a, on, a, on, a, on a much larger scale. Um, so in conclusion, um, I, I, the, the, as the behavioral studies also show a, a, an intersectional um, uh, uh, experience of inequality um, affecting people's mental health broadly construed, um, we should look at the context um, inequality, but also invalidation, and how that determines how a diverse brain becomes a vulnerable brain. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, some people to thank. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And I also add my thanks uh, to Sophie, uh, two absolutely brilliant talks coming from a very different perspective. So I have uh, been tasked uh, with uh, the exciting opportunity of acting as discussant. I, I really don't want to spend too long on my reflections though, because I can see that there were questions already coming in uh, to the chat, and I'm sure they'll be much more interesting than anything that I can come up with. Uh, but if you'll permit me maybe a couple of minutes of reflection, please could I encourage everybody who does have questions, uh, put them into the chat uh, so that we can see them. And then after this, I will hand back over to Pravitha to, uh, to chair the questions. Uh, thank you very much to both speakers for keeping to time as well, because I know in particular Sophie has, has got uh, uh, an ur urgent, uh, another urgent meeting coming up immediately afterwards, and she's really squeezing us in today. Um, so I think my key reflection um, from both of the talks was actually the extent to which they align. I, I, I don't believe that you actually coordinated in advance, but it was just fascinating for me to see um, uh, the extent to which the timing of, uh, of social disadvantage and poverty uh, aligned um, with the, the timing that Michael was talking about in his studies on uh, uh, white matter and, and neuroanatomy in the brain. And I think, Michael, that question about the, um, the kind of theoretical framework in which we should think about uh, why, why these differences exist is, is a really, really important one. You know, whether they're adaptive, whether they're maladaptive, or whether it's more um, uh, sensible to view these in, in the context of a, a, a diversity uh, framework. And I, I thought it was very interesting um, that you could include some cognitive measurements um, in that study as well. And, uh, one thing I want to highlight is that uh, there are several cohort studies, not least the Millennium cohort, that do have good cognitive data at repeated time points. Um, and uh, we know that cognitive differences, individual differences in, in cognitive processing, like an executive function, in emotion processing, reward processing, which is my own particular area of interest, are uh, related to uh, both current mental health problems in cross-sectional studies and also to a certain extent uh, longitudinally, and also that when people recover from mental health problems, these differences in cognitive processes don't actually go away in many cases. So you see similar kinds of uh, differences in terms of the pattern across different measures, even after people have recovered from depression. I think that's really important to understand um, because it, it suggests it's not just an epiphenomenon of the, the kind of low mood or low motivational state people are experiencing at the time. 
Um, and I think that would be fascinating to explore. Um, and I think we're actually in a unique position at uh, UCL to be able to do that to a certain extent. I want to mention not only the fact that we have this great Millennium Cohort Study, which is based here, but that there are also other um, excellent cohort studies, including the ALSBAC uh, study, um, also based in the UK, which, have, which has cognitive measures and also neuroimaging measures now, albeit that they weren't taken at, a, at such a young um, time in early adulthood. Um, and then, of course, the emerging data coming out from a, a big uh, study in the United States, the ABCD uh, study, which is uh, collecting neuroimaging data in everyone. So over the next couple of years, I, I can imagine that there's going to be enormous opportunity to look into these kinds of questions. And for me, the reason they're important is because of the, um, uh, the possibility of in increasing our understanding of the mechanisms um, that drive mental health problems in children and young, young people, which obviously has knock-on consequences for adults as well. Uh, because we have these distal factors that are very well established, as Sophie demonstrated. Um, but the real question is how, how that then gets translated into the fact that somebody is experiencing, say, uh, depression, anxiety in, in, their, in their mid to late teens, or, or maybe even psychosis in more extreme cases, because we know that these cognitive and brain processes are the, are the important uh, proximal factors. And then this naturally leads on to thinking about potential interventions as well. And so uh, I want to pause now um, and actually hand over to Pasco uh, Fearon, um, who has worked with uh, some colleagues in UCL who are interested in looking at intervention in relation to uh, socioeconomic inequality. Um, so Pasco, I don't know if you have a slide uh, that you would like to share. But uh, really, I can, that would be great. If, Thanks, if you could John. take a minute just to give us an overview, that would be brilliant, thank you. It might be a tiny bit more than a minute, but, but I'll try to be as quick as I can. Um, Thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, really incredibly interesting um, uh, talks. And um, I suppose what I thought I would do, you know, part of the part of the uh, raison d'etre for this 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 whole Catalyst seminar series um, and the focus on child and adolescent mental health within this program is is to try to seed um, exciting, new, innovative, creative approaches to mental health research that is interdisciplinary. And so we've had discussion today about neuroscience and we've had discussion about epidemiology and so I'll say a little bit about what's going on in an incredibly selective I should say uh, review of some of the things uh, that I'm aware of in terms of poverty focused intervention research at UCL and obviously the, the interest here is about can we find some linkages because I think the really exciting work is about linking neuroscience to intervention epidemiology to, to intervention and neuroscience and that's we haven't done enough of that and, and I think there's massive opportunities there as I think John was already hinting. Um, as, as, as both speakers pointed out I mean the impact of, of, of poverty on children's mental health well-being and development is absolutely enormous I mean it's in fact the challenge is to find outcomes um, that do not have a strong social gradient um, in children's early development so there are impacts on the, on mental health but there are also impacts on language development academic achievement attention behavioral problems sleep self-regulation depression prematurity physical health and growth I mean we're really talking about blunderbuss impacts and very interesting questions about the extent to which these are to do with multiple uh, embedded causes um, or global effects impacting multiple areas of, of brain and, and cognitive development. One thing that we really know very clearly is that the, the impacts of, of uh, poverty start very young and I have a particular interest in, in very early child development so hence that my, my little overview is a little bit skewed in that direction but we can see differences, stark differences in early language development related to poverty that happen they really take off at about the end of the first year and are very stark by the end of the second year of life. And um, I know Courtney Norbury is here, um, specialist in language development, and she would want to say that early language development is a very key precursor to many other future attainments, including mental health. And we often, as psychologists at least, forget about language, but that's actually a very key factor to think about. But of course there are others. And differences um, in brain development also start to become pretty apparent from the not brilliant data we've got on this from longitudinal studies in the US, but certainly it looks like um, the differences in, in cognitive and language outcomes uh, are, are, are paralleled in developmental differences in the brain. So what can we do? Well, just, just broadly to, to give an overview of what's happening across UCL, I think you can, you can sort of more or less identify about four different themes that are happening out there in terms of intervention. There's a really interesting uh, group of, of, of researchers doing work on multimodal early home visiting interventions, which are about trying to support families, 
in poverty who experience multiple threats to the the uh, to parental mental health and child well-being. There are also sort of a host of, of, of studies, this is particularly sort of in my area, where interventions are focusing on focal risk factors related to poverty, um, such as postnatal depression, uh, maltreatment and so forth. And then there's, there's a, a third area of intervention going on that is around direct poverty reduction and also early stimulation and support in low and middle income countries. And that's a really interesting topic relating to what Sophie was saying about the, the specific effects of, of direct uh, poverty alleviation as opposed to focusing interventions on, uh, on correlated risk factors linked to socioeconomic status like postnatal depression, maltreatment, maltreatment and so on. Um, and quite a lot of that's in low and middle income countries, but it's actually becoming much more interesting and um, policy relevant to think about that in, in high income countries to, to, to tackle inequality. And quite a bit of that's going on at the moment in the UK and also in the States. And then I suppose the other thing to really flag up is that we have a really strong group here at UCL focused on child mental health policy. And that's that's where a lot of this you know interdisciplinary work could really be made to have an impact um, um, uh, on, on 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 wider society, so there's a lot of potential uh, there that that um, you know we could we could make much greater use of. Um, I'll just quickly mention so Gabriella Conti's uh, in in economics again. I want to flag up the people who are doing things in areas that some of us might not be aware of. So, so she's doing fantastic work, particularly on the really large scale national uh, evaluations of interventions focused on poverty. So the national evaluation of Sure Start. Many of you be aware of. She's done fantastic work showing actually that the National Sure Start program had quite an impact on children's health in particular, and that was very graded by by levels of poverty. So the biggest benefits were accrued to the families who were living in the highest rates of uh, of, of poverty across the country. In the, she's also done nice work looking at the impact of early educational uh, preschool educational programs like the famous. Uh, um, Perry preschool program you may know about. The really interesting thing there is that what she finds is that a lot of the long-term effects on health are related to early gains in mental health of the children. So again that sort of creates, it shows just how interconnected mental health, poverty and long-term health actually are and there are probably bi-directional causal effects going on there. Peter Fonagy, Nick Mitchley, Camilla Rosen and myself are doing a lot of work in perinatal and postnatal depression and anxiety. Um, and we know they're strongly associated with 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 uh, with poverty, and that's another exciting area of research uh, going on at the moment, both in the UK uh, and and internationally. And then finally, I wanted to point out that there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the Institute of Global Health, um, uh, looking at poverty in a, in a global context and picking up Michael's point. So we're running a study with colleagues there and at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, called the Sunrise Project, which is an early childhood intervention program. Uh, Jolene Scordis uh, and colleagues in the Institute of Global Health are also doing really nice work on uh, cash transfer interventions in Kenya, and so. And I think there's there's much greater um, there's a lot of potential to to link these kinds of cash transfer schemes in low in middle income countries to developmentally sophisticated studies of mechanisms that that hasn't happened uh, so far. And here are two of the really important hubs within UCL that are looking at. Um, policy as well. So we have the, uh, the the Anna Freud National Centre for Children and Families, and we have the also the uh, NIHR Children and Families Policy Re Research Unit at ICH Gosh, which are both doing brilliant work disseminating policy for children's mental health. A lot of it focused on poverty and inequality. Great. Thank thanks, you so, that, thanks so much, uh, Pasco. And I, I feel like no one could possibly walk away from this uh, this webinar today without learning something new about uh, child and mental health research that's going on in UCL fabulous diversity um, of different intervention um, research going on there. And I agree, there's a, there does seem to be a massive opportunity here um, for us to start integrating uh, some of these more mechanistically relevant measures that we already know are associated with the uh, risk for development of uh, mental health problems into these kinds of intervention and indeed the epidemiological studies. Um, so I think there is probably a good point to finish my own reflections, not wishing to take up too much time. We have about another 20 minutes now uh, for questions and I can see they're flying in on, on the chat. Uh, good luck, Pravitha, is all I can say in, in managing to get through all of these. Um, and I'll hand back to Pravitha uh, to chair the questions. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Sophie and Michael, for those fantastic talks, and John and Pasco for reflections and further uh, food for thought. I just to let everybody know with the questions coming in, I'm going to try and focus on questions that 
are relevant to both speakers and are more about the cross sections of rather than like specific did you look at this in your study type questions which you can ask to speakers later or if we have time after the more sort of general questions so i'll start off uh, michael and sophie you can choose how who takes which ones first but i think both of you can probably comment and the questions that have been asked to both of you um the ones i've picked out so the first one is around um resilience but also things that can mitigate impact so people have asked questions around whether there are factors that can either amplify or mitigate the impacts of poverty on children's either mental health outcomes in the case of Sophie or sort of brain correlates in the case of Michael. Um, do both of you want to comment on this? I was going to let Michael go first. <laughs> Yeah, but we have got least to say. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I, one thing that uh, we found was that um, given a, a certain level of uh, family uh, deprivation, um, parental education was very important. Um, so, it might be that in the long term, this is a very important thing to, to, to find out also how it's mediated. It wasn't that obvious that, that the, the, the higher education uh, parents uh, treated their kids in a, in a particularly different way. Um, the second thing to say is that uh, there was, uh, in, in our study with respect to mining growth, uh, a moderating effect um, of, um, uh, as reported by the young person, overall quality of parenting, um, so that um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the quality of parenting did actually um, uh, soften the blow um, of having a, 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 um, a poor um, educational, um, no, sorry, a poor um, um, uh, deprivation um, uh, background. Um, I, I, there was lots of things that we thought might actually make a difference that didn't. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Sophie. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I guess in our studies, we thought about things like education, obviously having a parental education having an impact on mental health outcomes. But more broadly speaking, I think the things that can help with child mental health outcomes is focusing, like others have said, on the early years. Like when women are pregnant, we know that obviously development of, of, of um, pregnancies impacts on um, how things move forward. But e like it's such a shame that we don't have sure start centers anymore because they were showing to have such an important impact for the whole family, not just ch children and mothers and any kind of localized um, services that can mitigate against some of the impacts of poverty, I think is really important. Thank you both. Um, can I add something very, very uh, quickly on this? Um, that, you know, if, 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 excuse me for being too medical, but if, if, we, were, if we think about the kinds of things that um, uh, were risk factors for particular groups that we have improved public health about, it was about actually addressing the risk factor as a whole. So reducing smoking as a whole, or removing lead from petrol as a whole, or reducing pollution as a whole. We didn't actually go out and say, oh, you know, how are we going to make people more resilient to smoking? Um, and I think this is important to, th to think about that in the longer term, we need to be addressing the, 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 the overall causal factor, not just fixing it for, for particular most vulnerable groups. Thanks. Thank you. I think that leads nicely on to the next point. So Essie um, said she reflects on how astonishing it is that there's still such an emphasis on meritocracy and um, the arguments for everyone being provided with a basic human level of social security are stronger than ever. Um, and I think generally as to our speakers and panel, the question is like, how can we get this across to current government policymakers and generally to, you know, everyone, the idea that if everybody, if there wasn't economic insecurity and poverty that everybody would be better off. Um, in, before I hand over, I just wanted to mention, um, I just recently finished reading a book called The Tyranny of Merit, uh, written by a philosopher called Michael Sandel. If anybody's interested in these ideas around sort of meritocracy and why it doesn't actually make any sense, um, um, I, I recommend the book. 
but there's I'll hand over to another, Sue. There's another lovely one by Paige Harding, which, who's a geneticist, which really, again, from the geneticist point of view, takes apart the, the meritocracy. Uh, Pravita, I don't know if you noticed, but there is another question linking in with this, which I think is very nice uh, from Sophie. Oh, sorry, I didn't see Sophie that. Smith. It's the late, I, I'm happy to read it there, but it links it very nicely. So Sophie was sort of building on what Pravita was, was sort of just uh, saying, and what was my question is, do the panel think that we have enough understanding of what works uh, on the previous initiatives and, and what might be the kind of specific types of policy and intervention that could be effective and do we need to think about um, some areas in a different way, particularly in post-COVID context? Michael's got his hand up, so. Michael, you're on mute. No, that was left over. <laughs> um, so I, I, there, was a, there was a few things uh, that was mentioned. Pravita, what you said initially about how do we make this argument to the to the current administration, um, administration, the current government, uh, I would say that there's definitely a financial argument to be had. It's cost saving, if we think, take about this whole systems approach. Um, you know, if we, if we, there's a nice graph about it. If we put more money into the, into the early years as opposed to the adult years, like if you basically reverse that, um, you'll make cost, so many cost savings throughout the life course. Um, the only other thing that I can think of is just, keep, you know, keeping doing this kind of research. I presented uh, to local government and some, somebody said to me, but isn't this obvious, you know, the impact of poverty? And I said, well, I think it's obvious and you think it's obvious. But what there's a large body of people that don't think it's obvious. And in fact, um, at the meeting that my uh, colleague was at this morning there's a there's a move to try and think away from child poverty and towards family breakdown as the cause for lots of health outcomes and so it's about really you know ex, ex, keeping doing this kind of research so we can say it is child poverty but it is also it's part of this whole pathway and how like michael was saying it's this whole system so you can't think about it in um in one individual um context and with regards to these other initiatives there was if you look at the child poverty and how poverty was going down, all of those targets, it was, there was lots of localized initiatives that included short start centers that were shown to be advantageous and work. Unfortunately, they were shown far too late on um, that I think we need to look forward to, but it's about investing in people. And, you know, even things like I've heard colleagues in law and social justice talk about from a children's rights perspective, which is really important. So putting children front and center into this debate, let them know what's happening, give them a voice so that they can, because I think a lot of these problems is with, it can be with vulnerable groups that don't have a voice. Thanks, Sophie. Michael, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, I think the thing that I would have to add is that, that um, rather than do things, um, this is in addition, yeah, this is not an alternative. This is like the first do no harm uh, approach that if a government or an administration uh, says we're going to do this um, for the economy as a whole and for X, Y, and Z, that there is a very clear um, risk assessment of what that would mean for children and young people's mental health. And on the basis of the data, like uh, Sophie and Pasco and Lessa and myself showed, um, you can actually predict that there's going to be a lot of people having hell um, if you do certain things that, reduce, that increase um, uh, inequality or poverty. Um, so you can actually bring people to account uh, when you have actually predicted and you've asked them to predict themselves what the impact of what they do is going to be, um, rather than trying to prove things um, like uh, retrospectively. I don't okay. know if this happens. I, I wanted to add to that that, um, yeah, I guess we would advocate for putting health impact assessments, sort of any kind of impact assessment into any welfare policy, which currently isn't been, been done. So when universal credit was introduced, there was assessments, but it was based on you know, the digitalized service itself, it wasn't based on any kind of health impact. And then as a result, we saw, you know, huge rises in anecdotal reports and then research coming out showing it has a negative health impact. Um, and it feels like now it's too far along, they can't backtrack. 
Yeah, and just to sort of add to that, I think that's sort of the frustration generally with prevention and early intervention compared to reactive intervention, right? Because it's harder to measure the benefits of bad things that didn't happen because of early intervention and prevention than it is to wait for bad things to happen and then try to fix them. And I think that's just the frustration generally with preventative um, early, early childhood interventions. Mm. Okay, going to the next question. Um, a clinician, um, uh, from a clinician, what lessons for children and young people's mental health services or commissioners, both in terms of treatment and screening, would you say arise from both your research? It's a good question. I think for me, uh, my, my thoughts are all about advocating for vulnerable groups and advocating for clients recording you know they uh wasn't there an introduction of the social determinants of health being able to record um the social determinants of health of, of clients so you can actually see what is happening so we're collecting the data so you can see um the impact you know the health impact but i would say it's all about advocating for um people making sure you're recording that people are living in, in poverty and that that is the you know having a direct causal association um with health outcomes and pooling resources with any other partners like we need to be linking up we need to be a whole systems approach and linking up with other services so that we can offer universal support it's not just about one specific thing it's about all of these linking up that's all i can think of <laughs> Yes, so, sorry, I mean, I, our, our research isn't really, um, isn't, isn't really there to tell you that, that you can do X, Y, Z. Um, so I would actually argue from the, the other side that um, the, the more we have, um, you know, uh, clinical populations and the surrounding populations uh, involved in the co-production of research um, and also in thinking about uh, diversity and neurodiversity and how something may not be just a bad thing that is a, is a sort of disorder that needs fixing, but something that is a brain that has got different needs that we can't just stick it in this society that the rest of us have, uh, have made. Um, I think the better it would be in the longer term uh, to provide for those more vulnerable groups. So no ready-made answers, appeal for, appeal for coming and help. I have another question from Ashley, um, but I'm going to ask it to both of you, because I think it's actually relevant to both of you. Um, have, have you both considered looking at uncertainty versus predict, sort of predicted um, socioeconomic sort of, because there is this idea that uncertainty in your economic circumstances can be worse than sort of, you know, poverty that you know is sort of a recurring thing. Um, and I guess this particular point is also becoming more relevant in the context of the pandemic because the pandemic, if the thing it's increased the most, if anything, is the uncertainty around everything. So I guess the question to both of you is, have you looked at or considering looking at uncertainty in socioeconomic circumstances and both mental health outcomes and neurological correlates? You want to go first, Michael, for this one? Yeah, I, I very briefly, I so stop me briefly if I, if I go on too long. Um, I think that there's a, a really interesting animal paradigm, which is the variable foraging demand uh, paradigm for people who know uh, it, uh, where what you do is you, you make uh, food resources unpredictable for the, um, for, the, for the monkey mother, and you look at the development of the brain of the baby uh, monkey. Um, and what you find is that indeed um, it, it has got negative uh, uh, impact. So, and this is adjusting for the overall uh, amount of calories or the, the overall physical state of both the mother and, and the baby monkey. So I think, uh, of course, the, the animal intervention is, is, is a very powerful one, but I think what you, you say has got a, 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 an interesting solid basis, um, or at least it's got, uh, you know, a substantial basis in, 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 uh, in um, in climate research to, 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 to bring it to human beings. Um, and I would um, say that, um, that you can actually do something similar uh, by looking uh, longitudinally also across countries. So, so expanding the kind of natural experiments that Sophie uh, 
um, uh, looked at with the uh, uh, induction of poverty with respect to measures that induce uncertainty. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so, so yes, um, it, it's, it's, it's in the books, but it's actually not done. Sophie? Yeah, um, I haven't done anything on it, but I am looking again, it's like in the books, uh, we've got, um, we've just uh, got a grant accepted that is looking at universal credit. And this is one of the aspects that we'll be looking at. And I know from qualitative findings that that kind of uncertainty, if you think about the 20 pounds uplift that is happening, that is, um, as, a, as I said, is temporary within the pandemic has caused a lot of distress um, for people not knowing whether they're going to lose that money but also just from universal credit as a as a as a wider benefit people that are paid for weekly then the universal credit amount changes each each um month that they get it so that also creates uncertainty on how to manage finances and stuff which i again from qualitative findings seem to cause a lot of distress so i think it's really important um that we look at these these things yeah Thanks both. Before, just to take a pause on the questions, because I realize Sophie has to leave at 2.15 and the session officially ends at 2.15. Although if people have more questions for Michael and Michael, if you are able to stay, I'm happy for the session to carry on. But I just wanted to flag that the next one of these is going to be on Wednesday, the 19th of May, same time. And the topic is the parental brain. And we're going to have Helena Rutherford from Yale and Johannes Cole from UCL and the Crick, who will give two interlinked talks on this topic followed by like today a general panel and Q&A session. Um, I realize we're almost out of time. Um, so Sophie, because you have to leave, I think just to say thank you very much. If everyone could say thank you to both Sophie and Michael, I don't know if you know how to use the clappy signs on Zoom. <laughs> um, thank you so much, really, really, both of your talks were really brilliant and given us a lot of food for thought and the questions as well. Thanks everyone for asking really, really nice questions. Um, as I said, Sophie has to leave, but Michael, are you, are you able to stay for another 10, 15 minutes in case people have questions? There are some questions that are specifically to you. Uh, not 15, but uh, five or 10. I have a, I have a 30 thing that I need to, to... Okay. I'm going to head, head out, but it's been lovely. So thank you to everybody uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you, Sophie. Bye. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for attending. And as Michael said, he has five more minutes if people want to ask questions specifically to Michael. Um, and I, I suspect people have to leave, uh, but do stay and ask Michael questions if you have questions. Um, I have a specific question that Maddie asked for Michael, which was around the difference between damage theory and diversity theory, and whether this is just about how we label individual differences, rather than saying some people are worse or maladaptive. We should say that people are different brains, or are they actually like more different than that? Um, so, so, I mean, this uh, sort of uh, suggests that one introduces the the sort of the, the basics of the neurodiversity movement, uh, which as, as people may know, is, uh, had a lot to, to do with the uh, autist uh, community. Um, and the idea was that uh, a lot of uh, behaviors that uh, uh, have been previously uh, thought of as prohibitive of mental health and good quality outcome um, can actually be seen as, as part of diversity. Um, so there's enormous scope there to, uh, to actually um, um, bring this kind of thinking and this movement into, into research a bit more generally and to marry it with previous uh, approaches. Um, and the, so of course, yeah, it's not just people having a, a measurably different brain, it's about having a different person as a whole, um, indeed. Um, and, but the, 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 the question here, um, is to, to bring this um, and say, for example, if, if uh, 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 to, to bring this and, 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 and describe diversity in, in new terms, such as, for example, the, the different patterns of, of brain development, uh, rather than uh, rely only on the sort of um, uh, psychiatric diagnoses uh, to label the relevant spectra. 
Um, I don't know if that makes perfect sense, but the, the, the neurodiversity movement so far, to, to, to a large degree, still relies uh, on the um, and the university approach, the university movement is the more sort of politicized version of it, but the, the university approach still relies on the idea that there is a schizophrenia spectrum or a schizotic spectrum and an autism spectrum and, and, and so on. Um, and uh, my hope is that we'll be able to parcelate um, individual differences uh, in the brain um, actually on their own. Um, rather than as a, a sort of miniature version of schizophrenia. It's a, obviously, it's a long, long discussion, but yeah. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think if there are no other questions, that's we can wrap up now. Uh, thanks, everyone, again uh, for coming and staying a few minutes post the finish time, and see you at the next one. Thank you. Thanks, Farita and, and John. Really brilliant. Brilliant. And thank you, Michael, for a great talk. Oh, thank you. Thank really you. Wonderful. Thank Michael, you very much, Michael. Really in the spirit of the seminar series. So that was great. Thank you. And I also really had lots of questions. I mean, more about the the brain, like there was some, I mean, more specifically to you, like I'd love to have a chat sometime if that's okay. That would be fantastic. Yeah, by all means, we should have a- Good, uh, and then we've achieved what we set out to do. <laughs> Mission accomplished, I see. Different, uh, <laughs>